Okay, let, let's move on to the third album in this series, Free Spirit. The difference being, by this time, you had left Uriah Heep. Yes. So did you leave with an idea in your head, right, solo career now? Yep, I did. Um, when I left the band, I didn't really have a clue where I was going to go. I left the band in June of 1980 when we got back from a tour of Europe that ended in Portugal. I had made up my mind that uh, if the band felt that John Sloman was the right singer for the mm. band, um, I'm afraid we were on a different path. And it was time for me to quit. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I did have a bunch of songs. And surprise, to my surprise, Jerry um, agreed for me to do an album of those songs. So that's when we started gravitating towards a solo, hmm. another solo album. And I started to think in terms of a solo, not a solo career, but, you know, having my own band. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I just started work at the Roundhouse and... Uh, yeah, I worked on the album, and some of the tracks came out great, some of them not so great. Um, and in the process, I was rehearsing with various musicians trying to put a band together. And the office was booking a tour. So I had left the band. I had not left the Bron organization. Right, you're still part of it, obviously. We were working in parallel by that point. Was there a sense of you escaped the pressure of heat and the demands of constantly touring and, re and recording? You now have the pressure of a tour being booked. You have to put together your own band and also do an album. Yeah, there was no pressure for the album. The album was no problem because I you know, always loved being in the studio and the Roundhouse was a great studio. Mm. Yeah. And the engineers I loved working with there. Um, John Gallon was. Yeah, was John Gallon and... Um, it, it was just, uh, there was no pressure there. The pressure came from, my attitude was that I was determined to put something together that was bigger than the band. Right. It was bigger and better. I wanted to beat the band. And, you know, like anything else, when you have the wrong motivation, you usually end up with the wrong result. Mm. And unfortunately, by that time too, I, was, I had some personal problems with drugs and things right. like that. I was pretty strung out. So I wasn't thinking totally straight. I, I was on really a wrong psychological path. But still I had strong songs. Mm. And I had enough clean moments of thought where I could piece an album together. Um, it's just I didn't get it quite right. Um, but the pressure of forming a band and going out on tour and everything else was pressure I didn't need to have. I, it was pressure I put on myself. So in that respect, yeah, there was, I went into a competitive mode and that was wrong. You decided to produce the album yourself this time. Yes. Was that because you felt very confident that all the expertise and experience you had in the studio, you now knew you could actually bring to life what you wanted? Well, yeah, I mean, I wasn't concerned. I, I felt I, I knew I had enough experience by then because I had produced a couple of albums, a couple of bands' albums. Mm. Uh, I knew I had enough experience to do it and uh, there was really no need for anybody else to do it. And I felt if I was going to break away from the past, I needed right. to break away 100%. So even though I was in a studio that was downstairs from the yeah. Bron management and all the things to do with Uriah Heap, even though I was that close to it, I felt like I was breaking away by being completely independent. Did that put um, a, a sense of being free on you in terms of I'm now in control, I'm producing myself, I've written the songs, I have my own career, so I don't actually have to answer to anyone directly? Well, I still had to answer to Jerry in the sense that he was technically still my manager mm. and I his office was booking the, the live dates for my band. Um, so there was, there was some responsibility there, Malcolm, but um, I was beginning to feel like I was getting some freedom and I, right. I, I didn't realize at the time how much I needed it. Mm. I really needed to be, to be free in much the same way that I am now. You've brought in a lot of interesting musicians to play on the album. Ian Pace is on there, Kenny Jones is on there, Mark Clark, Trevor Boulder. So did you just basically, right, I know these people, I'd love to work with them, let's get them in. Well, the, it, it's quite interesting because I was living out in the country by then. And, um, you know, I had the big country house and all the cars, which was mandatory for rock stars in those days. Yes. 
wasn't really necessary, but <laughs> you had to do it. And I was living in what I called the rock and roll retirement belt. Mm. I, had, I was living near, Alvin Lee was out there, George Harrison, mm. um, Simon lived out there, Mick Ralphs, a lot of these guys lived out there, Boz Burrell. And what happened was I had built a studio next to my house. Right. Um, and the guys um, from Bad Company used my studio for their demos. Right. Mm. And in return, they came in and played on tracks on my album. We, we just made that deal. Right. And uh, that meant, of course, that because Boz was there and Mick Ralphs was there, I never had any beer left. <laughs> um, <laughs> this was a significant issue at the time. And um, it, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It, it, it was great fun to put that whole thing together. And, uh, you know, even so, even though I know I could do the album better if I had an option to do it again, I felt like the, the songs and the attitude on the record made a point. The thing I didn't like about that album, that one thing that I didn't like then and I hate now and I don't understand and I never will, is why they put a bloody red shoe on the, uh, front, yeah. on the front cover. Yes, I was going to ask you about I that. I have no <laughs> idea what it's supposed to mean, what it signifies. <laughs> I, you know, I get the album cover and I post for all these pictures. I think it was in somewhere in Cornwall where it was absolutely freezing. <laughs> And you could see because my nose is bright red yeah. and I'm standing there with this big warm jacket on and everything and a bright red nose. And then all of a sudden I see the cover and it's got a, a red shoe mm. apparently flying through the air <laughs> next to me. And I'm thinking, oh boy, this is going to be <laughs> interesting. Yeah. I, mean, I know my, a lot of people think I've already lost it, but now they're going to know I have. <laughs> <laughs> Barmy. It, yeah, that, that was a weird one, I have no, to but say. No, and I'll never know why because... <laughs> I think the people that, that did it have snuffed it. So I, I don't think that I can track that down. So it, it'll always remain a mystery. Uh, talking mm. of mystery, the opening song of the album, Inside the Mystery, was written by a mate of yours, Jack Williams. Yes, it was written with a mate of mine. Right. So was that a co-write? Yeah. Because I thought only he had the, uh, the credit. Yeah, well, it was a co-write, but there were some queer things going on with the publishing at the time. Oh, so we, right. we kind of hit a few things. Ah, oh, fair enough. But, but um, in the open. no, I, I, the bridge I wrote completely right. alone. Right. So, but Jack, you know, came up with some good songs and uh, he came up with some good songs later in life when I, when I was with Blackfoot and mm. Semi and Angel was a really good yes. song. Although the version on um, Rare and Timeless, I think is, is the best version of that song. Blackfoot's version was, yeah. Yeah, how do you get a southern rock band to play a, a <laughs> pop rock song? You, the answer is you don't. It's as simple as that. But um, Jack was a good writer and he's living in Nashville now and playing that game and mm. fighting that fight. And uh, no, I thought it was, a, it was a good song. I liked it. I like I liked the variation, the dynamics of it. Mm. And, you know, again, I had the freedom to do it because I was producing the record myself. I produced all the demos myself. And I produced the album myself, so I had this freedom and I used it. You also had two songs that actually I think came from about 1975-76 and Telephone and New Routine. Mm -hmm. So were they songs you felt needed revisiting? Yes, definitely. I felt they fitted the, the spirit of the album. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've got myself a new routine. Well, now I really did have yeah. a, a new routine. And sitting by the telephone waiting for you to call, um, was actually, I was poking my tongue out at the, at the powers that be because I really wasn't waiting right. for anybody <laughs> to call. So a bit of rebellion in there and everything. But I feel like it was a more cohesive album mm. than, than Eager to Please. And I felt like it was a step in the right direction. I really felt a little bit better by then. You stepped out in different directions. A very diverse album as well. Yes. Which I think is great. Well, I do too. And, and, and if you listen to anything I've done since then, you'll get the same impression mm. and the same feeling yes. about it. And, and I've always felt like that was, that was cool. The early Heap albums were as diverse as you could possibly yes. get. You know, to have songs like Gypsy, Come Away, Melinda, and, and things like that. I mean, this is, this is opposite end of the musical of spectrum or the... Uh, psychological spectrum and every spectrum you can think of um, and I've always enjoyed that I always thought that was good it was only when we started to 
get into things like you know demons and wizards and the concept stuff yeah that we were forced to go in that direction more and more and more so the first chance i got i, I broke away from all that and i think the great thing is that you almost are pioneering because other bands took on board that idea a few years later and started to bring other elements and influences outside of rock into what they were doing but you were doing it before anyone I wasn't aware of that, Malcolm, and I'll take that as a compliment. No, it is it? It, it a compliment. You, you were doing, you were, you know, dance rhythms and so forth, uh, pop, and, but what you were doing was interesting, and it worked. It was a cohesion to it. Well, and, and also, I think that one of the things about free spirit, I and mean, using the vocoder and things mm. like that, which yeah. I did, uh, do you feel all right? Um, which is is really a a real departure from anything uh, that I had done before, and and. I couldn't have done it in heap. Mm, no, there would have been no way that I could have gone and done that in a heap. I could have possibly done the song, but rearranged it so it fit more into the heap concept. So I no longer had the burden of this label. Yeah, I had the no no longer had the burden of this tag, which said I had to do things a certain way, and and, and I was really thoroughly enjoying it, even though I wasn't I didn't fully understand what it meant. It wasn't until much later yeah. that I realised what it meant, but. At the time, I, I sensed the freedom, and, and I was trying to make the most of it. There's a smile on your face, it feels, when you listen to the album. It actually does feel like a, you were enjoying it. I was enjoying it, but in another way, I was taking the piss. So, I mean, <laughs> the <laughs> smile could be interpreted yeah, either way, in, in, yeah. in many different ways. Yeah, no, look, I had just spent 10 and a half years of my life 100% mm. buried in, in a band and its image and all the things, the obligations that go with that, and whilst I recognize it and, and, and am grateful for it and everything else, it was time to get away from yeah, it, and get out of it. And, um, you know, I think, as I said to you earlier, I, I will always acknowledge and be thankful for the history of that. But it does tie you up. Mm. And I, could, I didn't want to be tied up. How did you decide which resistance to play on what track? Uh... Well, some of it was decided in uh, my my studio in Sonic Common, Dodgy Demos. Mm. Great name for a studio. It's a great. <laughs> <laughs> if I ever have another studio, I'm going to call it Dodgy Demos. <laughs> More Dodgy Demos. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know th there was a spirit over there. You know, when Simon and Boz would come in, you know, to cut a rhythm track with me, mm. there was just an attitude there. It was an attitude of guys who'd been around the block a lot of times. And I think it found its way into everything that we did. Like I said, I never had any beer because Simon and Boz, they found the ke kegs that I got from Breakspeare's Brewery in Henley. <laughs> and they found the kegs. And, and so by, by the end of a few days of recording, there was no beer left. <laughs> that was the kind of spirit that was going right. on there. A and yes, spirit. everybody yeah. had a smile on their face. Yeah. I mean, we were, <laughs> no, Kenny surprised. Jones was one of the funniest people I've ever, ever known. He, he, he was just such a funny guy, but in his own peculiar way. But he's a, also a great drummer. Yeah. And so there was a time when I needed that really straight, fixed mm. tempo style that Kenny had. It was, it, there was no flourish, no flashness about it. Um, I, there was times when I needed that, and Kenny was the perfect guy for the job. And we all got on so well together. There was never any question of who's going to get paid what and you know, that's not enough money for me. It was just like, you know, give me the key to the beer shed. So, <laughs> so <laughs> fluid currency. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Did you actually at any point think, maybe it might be fun to put together a band with Simon Kirk and Boz Burrell and do some shows with them to showcase this album? I didn't really think that that was feasible. Um, the only person from Bad Company who never came to my studio was Paul. Right. And uh, Paul had a reputation, and I saw it in real life. Uh, he, could, he could be a pretty nasty guy. And mm. I don't think he was at all pleased with what was going on, his guys coming over and getting trashed and having fun. <laughs> uh, I, I think Paul, was, having been a little bit of a control freak and a small man in a big man's world, mm. um, I don't think he totally approved of it. So he never showed up. Right. And uh, I thought that if I was to talk to you know Simon or Kenny or any of, any of these guys about maybe going out and doing some live shows together, I think it would have met with massive resistance, disapproval, and objection. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Having said that, I was working with some other players, but um, 
what happened eventually um, was that I uh, I did put a band together, um, but it really wasn't the band I wanted it to be. Um, I just again compromised, and that was a mistake. Were you putting the band together at the same time as you were recording the album? Were you thinking in terms of writing music, a live band, to interpret these songs? No, not really. I, I mean, I finished the album first, right. and then Jerry and I talked about us going out to do some shows, and my my set list was inevitably going to include some heap songs. Of course. So there was a little bit of a uh, conversation going on about that. Um, but I'm afraid, again, I have to take some serious personal responsibility for it not going quite right because I wasn't in the best shape mm. personally, mentally, physically that I should have been. If I had have been, then it would have been infinitely more successful than it was. But in a way, maybe again, it was enough of a failure for me to learn from and until came to the time when it failed miserably and I just ran away from everything. Was it the title Free Spirit almost so obvious it had to be used given the fact that you were free of the band. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, there was a, a, a girl in my life at the time that used this uh, f expression a lot, free spirit. You know, she, she was a free spirit mm -hmm. and she was one of those kind of American hippie girls and so on. And uh, I liked the expression and it fit. So I, I nicked it. <laughs> what was the reaction from Jerry Brown on Bronze Records when you played the album to them? Was it, yeah, this is what we want? Or no, it, it, it was a, a very mixed reaction. I think Jerry was probably as confused as I was at the time because he had divided loyalties now. Mm, yeah. Uh, plus also, you know, he had Motorhead in the, in, in the picture. He had Girls Girl School. School, Auckland. Yeah, yeah. And, and so on and so forth. I mean, he had so many fingers in so many pies. Um, that I had become a small pie, mm. uh, but that was okay with me because I really didn't want his approval. I, I didn't need his approval. I just wanted to know where to go and what to do and how to do it. Right. And I was going to figure that out on my own. Um, I don't think he was particularly impressed with the, with the album, except that he did come down to my band rehearsal one time because I know Heap was in the process of not knowing what to do, whether mm. to break up, and eventually I did break up. I think that maybe he came and looked at my band as potentially a replacement um, for Heat, but uh, nothing ever really came of that. And as I said, I, I wasn't the most approachable person in the world at the time. I really wasn't, did have my feet on the ground at all. I was still a bit lost. What I love about this album is the melodies are so strong. You listen to some of these songs and think, my God, that's a hit single. Well, yeah, I mean, in those days you could still release singles, yeah. but I just don't think Jerry felt inclined to promote it. I think that he felt these divided loyalties and I felt, you know, if he was going to jump down on one side of the fence or the other, mm. it was going to be Heap because Heap has always had the name. Yeah. You know, Heap established itself in the early 70s, it became hugely successful and was always going to sell tickets and was always going to sell albums, albeit at a, you know, shrinking rate. But um, if he had to make a choice, it was always going to be that mm. because he, the name had so much value. If he'd chosen my name, he was going to have to reinvest and we were going to have to rebuild. Yeah. And I felt like he didn't really want to do that. Was there ever a point in your mind when you thought, I'm going to go to him and say, listen, Jay, let me go. Let me take the album somewhere else because you're not into this and it saves you the problem of divided losses. No. No, unfortunately, he already had the album and it was already packaged and already ready for release, so there was not that option. With the red shoe on the cover, of course. Yeah, yeah. with the red shoe on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody out there knows why that red shoe's on the cover, please tell me. <laughs> what was your reaction when you saw the cover with the red shoe? Did I you... just didn't understand it. I showed it to my guy. I said, what this is? This? Did you do this? <laughs> I blamed everybody for it. <laughs> it was everybody's fault except mine. It wasn't my shoe. No, well, it's a, clearly not. It's a girl <laughs> shoe. I mean, what, I mean, what's it doing there? Yeah, well, yeah, I think a lot of people would like to know that, actually. I'll never know. <laughs> anyway. One of um, life's mysteries. Bottom line was that, um, you know, the album came out, died a horrible death. Um, the band went out, we did some shows, died a horrible death, and I packed up June of 81 and moved to the States. 
I think it's, a, it's very sad that Free Spirit did die there because it's, it is a really good album. I still maintain, had it been promoted properly at the time, it would have been very successful. Well, I think it had a chance. I think it would have had a chance. And I, again, I think it falls into this um, miasma of divided loyalties. Yes. I, I think we're taking it into a record company that's already got other priorities, with, mm. you know, Motorhead and Girls School and all this other stuff. And and the remnants of Heap and so on. And, and you lob my record into the pile and there's a lot of people scratching their heads and wondering what to do. So it never really had a chance. Um, I thought there was a couple of singles on there, mm. actually. I thought Brown Eyed Boy could have Absolutely been a, a, a really. single. I think Telephone's a potential big single yeah. as well. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, it was a little gauche with the sound of the telephone. <laughs> but, you know, you could do those things in those days. Could, sort yeah. of audio illustration, <laughs> if, you, if you want to call it that. But um, it, for whatever reason, it never got its opportunity. Uh, I still listen to it, actually. Mm. I don't listen to a whole lot of my past work. But I still listen to it because I do feel there's there's a spirit there that's, that's enjoyable and I can capture a lot of those memories from that time. Not just about the beer disappearing. <laughs> I can capture a lot of those memories from that time and remember that it was a time I enjoyed thoroughly but I mismanaged completely. Happens though. At least now people have got a chance to reevaluate it through this box set. What a wonderful thing that is and something I'm so thankful for and so thankful to the guys at Cherry Red for doing it because it's, uh, you know, you hate to see your work just sitting there and saying, if only. Those are my two least favorite <laughs> words in the English language, are if only. Mm. And so the guys at Cherry Red have given the albums a, a new chance and I really hope people pick up Free Spirit and uh, give it another listen and play it loud. I think they'll be surprised. Pleasantly surprised. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you, Kev. Thanks, Mel.